as my observing progressed, uh, I began to use binoculars for more things. I did observe the moon for many years. As a matter of fact, it was a stealth mission. Uh, in the 60s and early 70s, I was a kid and I snatched the family binoculars and would go and lay out in the grass and observe um, mostly the moon because I really didn't know anything else to look at. So as my observing got better, uh, I learned that I could observe all kinds of things with binoculars. And I kind of learned what to expect when I looked at something with binoculars. Um, so many years later, uh, I used my binoculars to uh, observe the Messier objects. Um, and I earned the Astronomical League Messier Award, which we will talk about further later. And I also learned that observing comets was something I could do. Um, I believe I remember Comet Halley came around in the 80s, the mid 80s. So I got my first telescope in 1985 and I began to use some binoculars back then. Uh, and I was surprised that I could see comets back then, but I could. So uh, more years have passed and I've been reading more about observing with binoculars and trying to learn where the resources are that I can use for binocular observing. So this talk will include some of that too. Um, why would you choose to use binoculars? Even if you have a telescope, um, there are reasons. If you don't have a telescope, there are reasons. Most people have a pair of binoculars somewhere in the house, or they know someone that might have a pair they would share. So in order to get started observing with just binoculars, it's usually a no cost solution at startup time. And that's really good for so many people. Um, my favorite reason is that they're so portable that if you on a whim decide to go and look after dinner or something in the winter, <coughs> pardon me, you can start right away. I've had some coughing problems, sorry. Just allergies. So it turns out binoculars are really helpful. There's a lot more stuff you can see than you might think. Now, the things that you see probably aren't going to be very detailed and in color and so forth. You really will need more aperture for that. But sometimes binoculars are the preferred instrument because they show a fairly wide field of sky. So if you're looking at something that spans a large bit of sky, <clears throat> binoculars are the choice. And a lot of times that's comics. Some of the deep sky objects are, are really big. So in either case, binoculars would be your choice. So either, either of those kinds of things, binoculars are really useful. A lot of people use them and they use a telescope at the same time. And that's because with binoculars, you can see a larger bit of sky and a lot of people use binoculars to find an object and then use the telescope to further scrutinize it. Well, is there a certain kind of binocular? Well, I don't want to uh, sell a certain brand. So instead, I'll just give you a general idea uh, of what can work and what works best. Any binoculars are going to work to some extent. 
And of course, the better the optical glass, the sharper your view will be. Now, the, um, uh, I frequently visit cloudy nights and there are always discussions on cloudy nights sorry, about what binoculars to get, what kind of optical performance, et cetera. So there are a lot of, let's say discussions. Some of them are holy wars and some are discussions. But the better your optical glass, the better. One thing that your binoculars really need to do is focus properly. So some binoculars have one focuser in the center axle, and I will show that of my camera. Here's a pair of binoculars. The center axle is this piece. And sometimes there will be a, a rocking lever there or something like that to focus with. The pair I just showed you has two separate focusers, one for each eyepiece. So this is a focuser and this is a focuser. I really like separate focusers better. Um, I've got some eye issues and so that allows me to really sharpen the focus best for my two rather unique eyes. Now, once you figure out how to focus your binoculars and how to get the best, crispest focus, another thing you're going to want to know is uh, the specification that you usually see printed on binoculars, something along the lines of 8 by 50 or 7 by 50. I think these are 7 by 50. Yes, they are. And it's printed on the back which is gonna be hard to see on these. However, eight is the magnif magnifying power. 50 is the diameter of the front lens, which I can show you here. So that is a 50 millimeter diameter lens. And the magnification is eight. So anytime I look with these binoculars, I'll be seeing eight times magnification. So this is a picture that I like to call the three bears. The set of binoculars on the left is my highest power uh, pair of binoculars. They're 16 power by 70 millimeter objectives. They're big, they're kind of heavy, and they are killers for deep sky observing. I really enjoy those binoculars. The middle set is a seven by 50 pair that belonged to my husband. This photo was taken before I had uh, the pair I've been showing you uh, restored. And we'll get to more of that in a moment. The little pair on the far right is a little sport binocular that we picked up years ago to take to football games and basketball games. And they work on the night sky too. They're very light. So this business of magnification, let's, let's discuss it a little. If your eye is working alone in the night sky, let's say you're in the front guard, looking up, no, no uh, magnification at all, really. Just your naked eye. We would call that a magnification of 1x. So with my uh, 8 by 50 pair of binoculars, the magnification of 8 times makes objects look bigger than just the eye alone. So that's, that's interesting, but really... The main thing about binoculars is the amount of light gathering. We'll get to that in a moment. The magnification will make your target look bigger, especially consider the moon. You can see the mountains and the craters and so forth. You really can't distinguish those so well with just your eye, but with binoculars, you begin to really see more detail. So if you if you want to think of something very familiar, this magnification concept uh, is demonstrated 
right away when you zoom your camera on your smartphone. You zoom in and you can see things, they look bigger. Oops, wrong way. Now, the, uh, the sad thing here is that when you zoom in with that camera, you know what happens, the shake in your hand. So that's gonna be an, uh, a side effect of magnification. Binocular aperture, this is to me the more important uh, thing about binoculars uh, as regards aperture or magnification. If you think of the aperture of the binocular uh, being able to catch photons, uh, it catches those photons across the entire surface of the lens. And of course, a binocular has two lenses. So in order to compare the area of your eyeball and the area of the binocular, we use high school uh, algebra, I guess, where the aperture of most adults' eyeballs are about seven millimeters when they're fully dark adapted. As we age, that number gets smaller, but we'll all pretend like we're 20 right now and we have seven, seven millimeter pupils. So if we compare the amount of light gathered by a seven millimeter eye pupil with a 50 millimeter binocular objective, this is the power square kind of thing. We have the radius of the binocular squared divided by the radius of the eye pupil squared. And that ratio is 51 times. So just using that simple arithmetic, one binocular lens is going to gather 51 times the amount of light gathered by your single eyeball. Um, I, one of the authors I'm going to mention in a few minutes always says, when observing two eyes are always better than one. Well, I really don't know an accurate formula to tell me how much better observing with two eyes with binoculars is compared to the single eyepiece in a telescope. But for those of us that have looked through uh, a bino viewer, for example, on a telescope, we can tell that observing with two eyes is usually better than observing with one eye because you see more detail. So even though we've calculated the difference between an eye and a binocular lens is 51 times, we know the net result of looking through binoculars is more than 51 times. So binoculars are surprisingly helpful. Now, as we try to move up to larger diameter binoculars, we find that the weight of the binoculars grows and glass is heavy. So is all that metal uh, that holds the lenses in place and provides the mechanical uh, support for everything. So the bigger the binocular, the more weight you have to deal with. Oops, wrong way again. Um, if we increase the weight of what we're observing with, we find that shakiness. And again, we saw that with the zoomed camera. I, I bet you've used your camera to zoom in a photo and you've realized that you either really have to brace the phone to keep it stable or, or you have to... Yeah, the do less. So we find the same thing with binoculars. And there's a couple of easy things I've learned to do. Uh, very often times when I go out in the yard for a quick look, I will try to lean uh, my elbows on, a, on the car or a fence or a mailbox or something and hold the binoculars to my eyes. And when I do this, I don't press the binoculars hard against my eyes and I don't grip the binoculars real firmly. I try to hold it as gently as I, I can. 
And if you do those two things, you, you lean your elbows on something and you hold binoculars, you know, you, you need to hold them strongly enough to keep them from falling. But if you're not squeezing hard on those, you will reduce the shake. Now, if your binoculars are beginning to get a little bit larger, uh, you can also put them on a, on a camera tripod and I'll have a, a picture of that in a moment. Not every binocular has a threaded hole to accommodate uh, a camera tripod. If it has a quarter 20 thread on it, you can mount it to a camera tripod. And then the other idea that, um, I, I can't believe this one, it was that good. Image stabilizing binoculars, they really were. Um, I was out at Big Woods several years ago looking at a comet. I had my 16 by 70 millimeter binoculars on a mount. And I looked at the, um, the comet I wanted to see and I got a good look. And then a friend, I think it was Mike, Mike Mantini, gave me his image stabilized can of binoculars and they were much smaller aperture. They work extremely well. Somehow they work. <coughs> so if you don't want to mount your uh, binoculars, might, might be time to dry. Sorry, image stabilizer. So there are a couple of things we can use. <laughs> I sound like I have TB. There are two ways to progress. The camera tripod mount is just a little L-shaped metal bracket. You screw it. Now, on these binoculars, you would, you would be looking for a quarter 20 thread hole here. And you would mount the, um, the L bracket here, and the bottom of the L would go into your camera tripod head. You do something similar with a parallelogram mount. <clears throat> and we'll talk about the advantage of that in a minute. <clears throat> well, you would probably be really surprised at how bad this is. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> I tried to put these um, 16 by 70 binoculars on a camera tripod when I got the binoculars. Those binoculars are heavy. So I had an L mount which is the metal, do, do I have a, a laser pointer here? Uh, there should be one, let me see here. There's a- I'm not seeing it. Anyway, well, I'll just keep talking. Um, can you see, you cannot see, can you see my cursor? I can. Okay. So this vertical piece here is screwed into the front of the, um, the binoculars. And the bottom of that L-shaped bracket is screwed into the top of the camera tripod head. So I put all this together when the binoculars arrived and it took me about five minutes to realize those binoculars are too heavy for that kind of mount. Um, but I think I've seen people use it very effectively with lighter, like eight by fifties or something like that. Really sad. Anyway, this is a different shot of the same rig. And I think you can see the old bracket mount a little better. 
The other way to go, especially with a heavier pair of binoculars, is a parallelogram mount. So the binoculars are fast, fastened very similarly to the top of the mount. The big difference with this mount is that it's got a counterweight. And this parallelogram fixture makes it so that you can push the binoculars straight up and bring them straight down. And they're still pointed at the same thing in the sky. You can't rotate it, but if you push it straight up and down, it stays put on the same object. So that's really important at my house because I'm about five and a half feet and Mark's about six, three. So anything that he can reach with his binoculars, I can't see and vice versa. But with this parallelogram mount, we can just move the whole rig directly up and directly down and not lose the view of the comet or the star or whatever we're looking at. So I have had uh, this mount for years now. Some people in New York made it in a, uh, a little side business. I don't think they still uh, make these mounts, but I know that Orion Telescopes makes them. And if you, uh, if you Google parallelogram mount for binoculars, uh, you probably will turn up some others that also make them. Um, these weights are, are heavy, obviously, because they counterbalance all of this weight. But it makes making minor adjustments to the pointing of the binoculars very, very easy to do. And I don't mean making big motions, but making refinements, really. So if you have um, heavy binoculars, you probably would benefit from a parallelogram now. I certainly did. Um, this is a front view of the big binoculars on the parallelogram mount. And you can see, <clears throat> you can see that the, um, the mounting to the binocular body is the same as with the L mount. You just have a, uh, a knob there that screws into the front of the binoculars. And that's all it takes to get it uh, mounted. So if you have your device all set up and the mounting all set up, now we need to figure out what in the world we can see with the binoculars. And it turns out that they, they can do an awful lot, probably more than you think. Um, you don't have to start with an expensive telescope to see the night sky because binoculars can get you started. And again, it's a low cost thing that most people have. Um, along with uh, the optical quality, you're gonna wanna be in a darker observing location. Those are the two things you may be able to control as far as finding a dark place to use your binoculars. Um, light pollution really turns out to be a problem for all of us, unless we're looking at the sun. <laughs> the, um, the advantage and convenience of binoculars at home um, kind of maybe mitigates this uh, light pollution argument. Excuse me. Uh, what I will do when I observe at home I live in Gary and there are street lights everywhere and people's lights and so on. <clears throat> I will go to a dark corner of the yard where none of the neighbor's lights are shining directly in my face. And I'll lay down in the grass and use my binoculars there. And I feel like that is the most convenient, quickest way to proceed and still be able to see some things. And even given all of that, um, the things I can see are pretty impressive. You would be surprised. I hope that you will try it. <clears throat> now, 
It turns out that pointing your binoculars anywhere near the sun is a really bad thing. Um, if you've been in the astronomy club for very long at all, you probably know not to do this. However, there have been experiments, and I have to say this, there have been experiments where binoculars were pointed at the sun and with a paper held back where your face would be, the paper caught fire. We're really serious about this. Don't observe the sun unless you have proper solar filters. And you paid money for your proper solar filters. If you have them, you would know. Don't just think you can look briefly because your eye will be ruined. It will be bad. So given that warning, um, let's see. The moon is between first quarter and full right now. So there's plenty to see. You could go and look today. If you can balance your binoculars, so they're steady, take a look at the moon, um, the mountains and the craters and the maria and the big basins are very visible in binoculars. Um, since we're not quite to full moon yet, you can observe along the terminator. And that is the area between the sunlit side and the dark side of the moon. Um, that's where you see the most detail because the sun would be coming in at a low angle on the moon at the terminator. And the uh, tops of mountains are more visible. The shadows across uh, craters are more visible. It's really a cool thing to do. And this is what really set the hook for me in 1969. Looking at the moon at the fam with the family binoculars really felt like I was in a flight over the moon, just looking out the airplane window. It was super cool. And well, it was really cool. Hello, Phyllis, it's uh, Doug. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Ryan Hobbs. Um, Ryan asks, uh, with appropriate solar filters like Thousand Oaks, for example, can you use regular astronomy binoculars to view the sun, sunspots, or prominences? Um, you can see sunspots with a Thousand Oaks filter and binoculars. It would have to be a fairly large spot to be able to see it. Uh, prominences are going to require hydrogen alpha filters. And those are rather expensive. Uh, the little Thousand Oaks uh, filters, either mylar or glass, are not going to allow you to see those prominences. So yes, you can observe the sun with binoculars with uh, a Thousand Oaks filter. You'll need one over each side, each lens, or you'll have to cap one of the lenses. You could do that too. Um, but you're not going to see the prominences that way. Uh, Let me just interject uh, there too. It, in yeah. The, that don't make the mistake of thinking that you can get like uh, just any hydrogen alpha filter. We have hydrogen alpha filters for viewing nebula, and those are not uh, rated for for no. viewing the sun. No. And so you, you would still damage your eye with a filter like that. You need to make sure that whatever hydrogen filter you get, if you do get one for binoculars, that it is rated for the solar sun. observing. And you know, Doug, as you say that, I don't, I'm not aware of a hydrogen alpha filter for viewing the sun that will fit binoculars. And it, neither am I. Um, it's possible there is such a thing, but I'm not yeah. aware of it. Yeah, I could see if you could get one for 50 or 70 millimeters. I imagine you could get a full aperture one for that. But, you know, uh, it's, uh, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen it. Me neither. Um, is there another? No, that's, that's all I just wanted to. Okay. All right. Um, so important points. Stabilize your binoculars somehow to get your best view. Um, the moon will look bright to you, but it won't damage your eyes. There's a difference between harmful bright and just bright. Uh, 
I would share another observing technique for stability. Um, and I've done this many, many times. I've uh, mentioned how I will go outdoors, especially during the winter time, early in the evening. And I will lay on the backyard in the grass somewhere. And I will take my binoculars in my hands and I will assume that I'm looking up so that binoculars are resting against the orbits of my eyes. And as long as I rest them on the orbits of my eyes and I'm looking up, I don't really have to grasp and I'm able to view without um, a mount with very good stability that way. So I've done that with both the 16 by 70 binoculars and I've done it with the seven by 50 binoculars. So I learned that at a young age and it still works for me today. Now, if you are observing, not in the up position, but you know, towards the horizon, is not going to work. But if you're lying down and you can balance those binocular eyepieces against the orbits of your eyes, then it will be stable. Just don't grasp it hard. That will make things shake. Okay. Um, I guess we already saw that one. Uh, you can also observe the planets. Um, I've done this many times and I suspect some of you have too. Um, Mars really isn't in a great position right now, but you can tell the color of Mars. You can tell it isn't the same color as other stars. It's a pale orange color. Um, the same goes for Jupiter, which is up in the evenings right now. Uh, if you look at Jupiter, it looks bigger than stars and it's a different color. It's a creamy yellow color. Uh, the same goes for Saturn, which is also up right now. Um, it's a pale yellow color. So pay attention to the colors of the planets. There is something there to distinguish. Uh, uh, when you look at Saturn tonight, because I'm sure you will, you'll notice that it's oblong in shape. It's not the same round shape uh, as Jupiter. And that's because you're seeing those rings. You probably can't um, resolve the ring because it's just not enough aperture in your binoculars to do that. But you'll be able to tell that it isn't round. You'll be able to tell it's kind of oval. Um, when you look at Jupiter, you may see four tiny stars and they're lined up around Jupiter. They're in the same line with the bands of Jupiter. They like an extension. Those are the four Galilean moons. And if you look at these um, night to night, you'll notice they're moving. Sometimes there won't be four. Sometimes there may be three because one of them is either in front of Jupiter and you can't see it, or it's behind Jupiter and you can't see it. So Jupiter is a fun thing to look at night to night. Another thing that changes night to night is Venus. You can see Venus. Uh, um, sometimes it's a very full disk. Sometimes it's a crescent. And it does take time for it to change. But you can discern that Venus some nights is not a nice round disk. And it is bright. Um, I would say it's a bright white yellow color. So you can look for that. Hey, Phyllis. Yes. Uh, we have a question from Rob Parsons, and that is, is how do you determine the quality of optical glass for a product? Oh, boy. <laughs> well. I may have a comment on that if you want me to. Uh, you know, there, there's an optical quality, and there's the alignment of the optics in the binocular. Mm -hmm. And I'll let Doug talk about that. <laughs> So just to, for, <coughs> if you look at the specifications for your binoculars, you're going to see a, um, a value that says BAK4 or BK7. 
Okay, and what this does is this actually re refers to the amount of bubbles or actually actually oxygen bubbles that are actually in the glass. And so uh, <clears throat> BAK4 is less than BAK7. It's, it, if you get BAK, correct me if I'm wrong about that, maybe it's BAK7 and then you get BAK4. But bottom line is, is that I, yeah, the BAK7 is going to be a little um, less, less quality. BAK4 is going to be a little higher quality. I might have that backwards, so if I get that backwards, forgive me. But I believe that that most uh, most standard uh, binoculars that you're going to buy, like for instance, if you go to Walmart and you buy a pair of Legacy PowerView Bushnell PowerView um, fifty uh, ten by fifties, they're gonna yeah they're gonna come out with BAK seven glass. Okay, the BAK four glass is gonna have. Um, you know, less, slightly less. You're going to pay more for that glass, but I'm going to tell you right now, there's only a very slight difference between the two. So, you know, I don't think you're going to get any better. Now, there are uh, binoculars that, that are made with fluorite, fluorite glass, and that uh, those are much more expensive, and you get better, you get better light passage and everything. So it's expensive. It's very expensive, but. <clears throat> Like I said, I have a pair of BAK7 uh, Bushnells, and I did my entire binocular Messier on those 10 by 50s, and they're great. So, uh, but anyway, I'll I'll back off now. And if you want to go ahead and make a comment there. Um. So I saw in the chat log, somebody asked when Venus would be at a crescent phase again. So I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that the phase of Venus tonight is a little bit more than first quarter, so to speak, is a gibbous phase. Um, and so I can't exactly answer the crescent question, but if you were to look tonight, it would be a gibbous phase. Now, back to the quality question, Rob. Rob, um, are you satisfied with that information? Because we have someone on the call today who can go into as much detail as you can stand. Is um, there? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. I, I was curious if, if there was some sort of a scale or a rating number, you know, that kind of like part of the specification sheet, you know, where they give you an idea of, of you know what kind of uh, yeah quality you're getting for your for your dollars. Well, I can tell you this. Um, in my experience, binoculars vary pair to pair. In other words, there could be a respected brand, and some of those uh, models are really great, and some are not so great. Um, I would say that I think. The glass and the coatings are generally uh, something you can expect to get a good um, a good set. The question becomes: Are they lined up properly? Uh, Jim, who's also on our call right now, um, and I've, I've asked Jim to unmute himself so he can. Uh, there he is. He's unmuted. So. Did you do it yet? Jim Presley, are you there? I don't know how far we want to go. <laughs> uh, well, how about this? If you purchase a pair of binoculars, you will find out yourself whether they're good or not. So if you purchase a pair of binoculars, <clears throat> who would be wise to be able to return them? Now, as far as the optics being aligned, I believe Jim knows how to look through the lenses in each direction and tell that quickly whether binoculars have been knocked out of alignment during shipping or they're still aligned well. Take it away, Jim, but only for a moment. Okay. Well, if you're looking at like the roof line of a building, you want both of the uh, views to be exactly you know, the same plane. If you see this, it's gonna be a problem. Your eyes will have to struggle to pull, uh, and they'll try, they'll try to pull that back in line and you'll end up with a headache and your eyes will feel uncomfortable. So 
the first thing I do is pull them away from my eyes and look at a distant target and make sure they're all at the same level. And while you're doing that, if you look into the eyepieces and you see, instead of a perfect circle, you'll see, uh, well, I gotta get my hand right. You'll see kind of a four-sided, almost like a diamond shape. That means it's a BK7 uh, set of uh, prisms and they are less good. They're, they're certainly just as sharp if it's a good pair of binoculars, but the difference between the BAK4s that Doug mentioned is that I think they're a little more contrasty. And it's a subtle difference. If you're a beginner, you'd never even probably see it. But if you've looked through a lot of binoculars, I prefer the BAK4. And now they've started selling binoculars with uh, ED glass. And that also increases contrast. But just as Phyllis said originally, and then I'll stop, the price starts to go up exponentially. A lot. A lot. But so the, pro the real point is, any pair of binoculars is better in terms of just seeing what Phyllis is describing on the moon. Uh, you can see the craters uh, on, on any of these. One, one real quick thing. Uh, there are two types of binoculars here. These are roof prisms, and they go straight through, and they tend to be more expensive to get a good pair. Uh, the, the ones that Phyllis showed are uh, not roof prisms. What do you call those? Poro prism. Coral prisms, yeah. So they're actually wider and maybe a little heavier, but uh, from the beginning level, they would be a more uh, a more economical way to start. The roof prisms are kind of expensive usually. So does that answer your concern, Rob? Oh, oh yeah, that's that's uh, okay. that's good information. I have a pair of Nikon ten by fifties look out two binoculars i bought these back in the 80s and these have been these have held up really well but i've never known how to compare the quality of this class to any other you know i mean has the quality improved since the 1980s i don't know but there's no markings on here that tells me that it's this bak4 or 7 or anything else i think with the nikons you will be fine i've been real happy with these Excellent. Okay, let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so back to the slides. Um, there are planets that you're probably not going to be able to see very well. Um, Mercury, you can see Mercury. I, you may not have tried before, but you definitely can see Mercury, but it will look like a star. It will be uh, an orange star. You can see Uranus. It will be a, a blue green star, but it'll be a star. You probably won't be able to see Neptune or Pluto. Um, they are just too dim. And always be careful if you point your binoculars towards Mercury or Venus, be sure you don't accidentally get the sun in your view because of the reasons we already stated. Comets is my very favorite thing to observe with binoculars. Um, they're usually large because when we see the comets best, they're near Earth. And because they're also near the sun, they usually have a nice long tail. Um, binoculars are a terrific choice because they gather some light and they cover a wide area of the sky. So you could theoretically see on a comet the bright head of the comet, the coma. And you can study that and decide how much of the coma you see and what it looks like to you. And then you can look at the tail. Sometimes the tail has an interesting shape. Sometimes you can see a split in the tail. And some of these things are very definitely viewable with binoculars. So the more attention you pay to the comet, the more you will see. Again, a dark moonless location is best for seeing comets. And if the moon's up or you're in your backyard, you do the best you can do. I have certainly viewed comets from my own yard in Cary. It is not what I would call a great dark location, but I have certainly done it. So you might also be interested to look at some deep sky objects. 
Um, the best objects to view are the large bright ones. Uh, I would say that looking at open clusters is about the best thing you can look at in the deep sky uh, batch of things. The open cluster M44 uh, in Cancer is a good one. The Gemini and Auriga clusters, M35, 36, 37, and 38, are fabulous. They're coming up now. Um, you might have to wait until later in the evening until those are further up in the sky. But they're so neat to look at because the stars are different colors. They, um, they almost look like diamonds all black velvet. So in open clusters, as long as it's not a really dim one, uh, generally are good binocular targets. Um, globular clusters also are terrific tar targets. If it is a globular that you can resolve with your binoculars, they just look like beautiful points of light on a dark background. Right now, you can look up and see M13 and M92. Both of those are in the constellation of Hercules. Um, they will probably look like little fuzzballs in a seven by 50 pair of binoculars. And if you have larger binoculars, they may begin to look like an actual tightly packed uh, circle of stars. So the larger your aperture, the more you will resolve in a globular cluster. If you're looking in eight by 50 binoculars, you probably will only see a fuzzball, but you can see them. And by the way, folks, globular clusters are a pretty long way away. Some of the open clusters are much more close to us. But globular clusters are uh, generally around the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. So if you think about how far you're looking and seeing with just binoculars, it's really kind of impressive. <laughs> Um, another thing you might look at this time of day or this time of year are the Lagoon and Triffid Nebulae. Um, I looked at these out at Big Wood, Woods a couple of uh, weeks ago. They, uh, they're just beautiful objects. They may look like just smudges of light depending on how dark your location is and how uh, big your binoculars are. <clears throat> but I've seen these naked eye. Uh, we were out in the Grand Canyon area and we saw these rising through the trees uh, one evening. So no telescope, no binoculars. You can see these and binoculars only help the view. So those are, those are terrific items to view. Those are both in the constellation of Sagittarius. Uh, another useful technique you might have, and this, this is similar to the solar filter question. Um, I met a friend down at a star party once who had an 8 by 50 pair of binoculars. And he put UHC, ultra high contrast filters, in each eyepiece of his binoculars. And he told me to look at... Um, I think it was Jones 1 in Gemini. I, I couldn't believe that I could see them. And then I began to scan around a little bit. And it turns out that uh, a filter like an ultra high contrast filter really helps the binocular view. It's not such a strong filter that it eliminates all the light, but it definitely jacks up the contrast between a dark night sky and some of these little faint fuzzies. I don't have two UHC filters, so I can't do this at home, but it was a cool thing to try the night I did try it. You might also try attaching something like a broader band deep sky filter that would help you to see uh, galaxies. Like M31 is a great choice. It's probably going to have to get a little bit later at night or a little bit deeper into the fall before you can see 
M31, which is the Andromeda galaxy. But you can certainly see those with binoculars, that with binoculars. You can definitely see it from my carry backyard. So it stands up to some light pollution and it is big enough and bright enough to be seen in our binoculars. M33 is a, a galaxy near M31, but it's, it's much harder to see. So if you are in a really dark sky location, you should be able to see it. It is big, but it's tenuous. It's not as bright as M31. I had a friend years ago who claimed there was no such thing as M33. Couldn't be seen. And he had an 11-inch Celestron telescope. And so I can remember having binoculars and looking at M33 standing a few feet away and telling him, and I don't think he liked that very much. But alas, you can see it. I have done it. Yeah, there we are. Another thing that I find the Europeans do a lot more of than we do, and that is looking at variable stars. And the game there is to, to try to learn how to judge the brightness of a star that is known to vary over time in brightness. Some of these are, are pretty well-known stars. Um, you can go to various monthly magazines that will list these, and they will tell you when some of the brighter variable stars reach their maximum brightness. And so the game would be to look at that star each night with your binoculars for some period of time. You know, it could be a few hours, it could be some weeks, but you'll be able to see the change in the brightness. And again, I, I see that the Europeans do this. I don't know if the Americans do it as much, but it can be done. Another thing you can do is look at double stars. Um, to me, being able to separate double stars, because so many of our stars in the night sky are doubles or triples. Um, being able to distinguish the two stars is sort of interesting, but it gets really interesting when you notice that the stars are a different color. And that is definitely something you can do with binoculars. Um, there are several I can think of that are really, really pretty in their contrast, maybe a yellow star and a blue one, or a yellow star and a red one. And you can learn that you can distinguish these colors. And then when you look at double stars that are closer in color, like maybe one is a yellow and the other is a white, you get a good at even distinguishing that. So there was, I think there is an article in the September Sky and Telescope. I believe it's the September issue. Um, and it's about observing objects in the constellation of Cygnus. And there is a paragraph there about observing the star Albireo and how pretty the pair is. It's a yellow and a blue. And if you can get your hands on that article, I would encourage you to do so. And you might experiment with uh, binoculars looking at Albireo and determine whether you can see the difference in the two colors. You certainly can in a telescope. The game is whether you can do it in binoculars. It's really, it's a good thing. And because there are so many double stars in the night sky, there are plenty of things to look at with binoculars. Well, what else might we look at? There are thousands of targets you might see with binoculars, uh, all the different stars, the different colors, brightness, and so forth. A lot of these things are listed in monthly astronomy magazines. And I have seen a column by an author change over the years. Um, Astronomy Magazine used to include one, and I think they've dropped that at the moment. The Sky and Telescope does have it. They have a, a short section in the middle of the magazine where the sky chart is, and it's called um, Binocular Highlight, I think, by Matthew Weedle. It's, uh, it's something that changes every month. 
And there's a longer column that shows up every month in a British magazine called Sky at Night. This is written by a fellow in Great Britain named uh, Stephen Tonkin. And he gives a description of uh, the objects. He gives a little chart with the, the objects circled so that you can tell what he's talking about and where it is. So that is in a UK magazine. You can usually find that um, in Barnes and Noble on the uh, newsstand shelf with astronomy magazines. There could be other columns that I'm not aware of at the moment. Uh, there's a, a magazine called Sky News from Canada, uh, and I think it's bi-monthly. There's obviously astronomy magazine in the US, and there's another one from the UK called um, Astronomy Now. Whether it has uh, a binocular column, I'm not sure. So, do, 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 do. Um, other things you might do, if you're kind of the kind of person who enjoys books, and that's how I started out, there are a couple of really good books that people use. Uh, the oldest one, and the one that I happen to have and use the most, is called Touring the Universe in Binoculars. It's a paperback. Uh, I'd say it's about an inch thick. You can still get it. Um, it is a description, constellation by constellation, of things you can see and how they looked to the author um, through his binoculars. The other binocular book that I have, and it's much newer, is Binocular Highlights. And it's, it's in a nice binding that you can use outside in the do. And it has a description of the object and a description of the object, a little chart. So that is called Binocular Highlights. It is written by a Canadian fellow named uh, Gary Serrani. And the other book I know of is called Binocular Astronomy, written by Stephen Tonkin. So you can find any of those books currently in print, and they're all good. Uh, if you want to go the free route, for starters, I have an excellent resource to refer you to. Uh, it is Stephen Tonkin's monthly Binocular Sky newsletter. So you can go there each month and download his newsletter in the form of a PDF file. He includes a description of the objects. He includes a chart where you can determine where they are. And if you like QR codes, the QR code that you see on screen will take you to binocularsky.com. And I will share that link at the end of the presentation via notepad. Really good and free. So that's a good one. Um, if you want to get a more formal observing program, uh, the Astronomical League, which we're a part of as a club, has uh, two, two great observing programs to get you started. The Messier Binocular Program lets you observe not all the Messiers. You don't have to get all, all of them. Some of them are really tough uh, in binoculars, but I think, what is it, 70, Doug? Is that right? You're muted. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's 70. Um, okay. I, I got, I, when I did the program, I got, uh, I, I got 74, but again, you, you only have to go to, right. to the limit. And uh, let me just say this, is that if you go look at that, uh, you, you have to choose, he's got, so he's got it uh, divided by uh, easy objects, medium yes. objects, and uh, difficult objects. And that's also divided by when you can see them, winter, spring, summer, and fall. So you, you know you can easily get these, project, these objects within that particular uh, quarter of the right. year. Right. So, um, but I think that the majority of the program is you only need to get like, most of it's all easy objects, what he considers easy objects, and the other is is that uh, 
maybe three or four objects from the me medium or challenge group. So it's, it's a pretty easy program to, to complete. It really is. Um, it, I think in order to do the, either one of the astronomical leagues observing programs, um, you need to have their list of objects, their, pardon me, their requirements, and you're gonna have to learn how to use a chart or a map of some sort. I am now working on another class we can, we can uh, have for free on using charts and trying to find things without uh, digital setting circles or a go-to mount. So that type of information would be very useful to you if you want to do the binocular Messier or the binocular deep sky program. They're both really nice lists. Uh, I know some people have done the Messier program. A few have done the deep sky program. So there are people in our club that could lend some assistance if you decided to go either way. Anyway, stay tuned about charts and how to star hop. That is find objects in the night sky with just a chart and no go-to or electronics. So I have one final thought and yes, Doug. I was gonna yes. say, Jim, did you wanna make a comment about that, Jim Presley? He's, he's muted. <laughs> Mute? Unmute yourself, Jim. <laughs> Hit the roll. There he is. Well, I'm not sure. I was going to mention the variable star thing. There's a, a young lady named Stella Kafka, and it's just Stella, S-T-E-L-L-A-K-A-F-K-A. -A -A, and if you search on her name, you'll go to the variable star observing uh, information. And she is a real proponent of variable star observing. And an infectious speaker. Uh, yeah, a lot of fun. So uh, she, if you talk to her, you'll, she'll make you uh, think you should observe variable stars. She really will. <laughs> She's terrific. Okay, so I wanted to wrap up with a final thought. And I think Rob said he had a pair of Celestrons that he had had for many years, but he didn't know how good they were. Well, <laughs> this is a true story. Um, I inherited the binoculars you see on the left. And I always, I always figured they would come to me in the family since I'm the only fool in the family that would have them fixed. So as I delved into it, I found out that those binoculars were worth fixing. So I sent them to uh, Sutter Optical, Optical Repair there in Oklahoma. He, uh, his name is Corey Sutter. He served in the Navy and that's where he learned how to work on binoculars. So uh, I sent him my my 76 year old lights binoculars and they came back looking like the pair in the right side of your screen. And those are indeed these binoculars. So it turns out, I don't know whether you can see this or not. These were sold by the Lights Corporation in September of 1945. I wrote an email to the Lights, which is now Leica. They had a handwritten sales record from 1945. This was sold, this pair was sold to a US Army occupation officer right after World War II, uh, which turned out to be my stepfather. He had just gone to Europe uh, in the occupation part of Germany's experience. And he bought these binoculars. He was a career army person uh, who worked in artillery. So when I first looked into these binoculars, they had a graduated reticle in them that an artilleryman would use to decide exactly how far and, and so forth to regulate the artillery fire. 
So I think these binoculars, as rough as they look in that lower left picture, I think they started out in Germany right after World War II. I know they went through Korea in that conflict, and I think they went to Vietnam too. So they had some, some action. And when they came back from Sutter Optical Repair, I was absolutely stunned at what they could do. And being lights optics, 76 year old optics, optics, they work beautifully. They work well mechanically now that they've been worked on. They were cleaned inside. They were collimated, meaning the optics were uh, lined up properly. And they work just beautifully. So if you've got a really old pair of binoculars that you think might be good, um, some people in the club might have a look and give you an opinion. And there are definitely opticians out there that can work on these things and spruce them up. It's possible. And finally, I hope tonight you'll take a, a quick look at the moon. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn will be up. There are things you can definitely look at and see even from our light polluted backyards. And with that, I'm going to try to share with you some links. And I'm going to try to do that if it'll let me. <laughs> Doug, so, I can't get to the chat screen. Um, Okay, if you, if you go over there and you look at your... I got it now. Okay, here you go. All right. Um, you should be able to see in the chat screen some hyperlinks to the various things I shared during the talk. Uh, there are links to the abs, uh, Astronomical League's observing programs, and there is a link to that binocular sky webpage where you can find... Um, Right now, you can see the September newsletter. He's very, very good about posting a new month's newsletter on the first of the month. Uh, he was he was out of action last month for the first time in my memory, and he's back this month, and I think you can expect to, to see his stuff monthly. Any questions? Yes, I don't see that in the chat yet, uh, Phyllis. Say again. I don't see that. I it's not on the chat in the chat in the chat yet. The links. Oh, there you go. Very good. Sorry. Very good. Excellent. Any uh, questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna uh, unmute everybody. Uh, just you know, try to keep you know, the ambient noise down. And if you'll all kind of talk, ask questions one at a time. I'll just unmute all. You'll get a message on your screen to say, "Please unmute your." Uh, your device. So if you have a question, go ahead and unmute. All right, here we go. Um, I was looking around at tripods for binoculars, just curious what was available. And I was interested in finding a tripod that would have like the little, some knobs on it so I could adjust the azimuth and the uh, altitude without, you know, breaking, breaking the bank. <laughs> and I was gonna see what I could do just, you know, with some sort of adapter for, for these Nikons that I have. There's no, there's no uh, screw terminal here too, but I think there's adapters that sort of wraps over the top or something. But do you have any- Rob. Uh, check in there and see there on a lot of binoculars there's a little uh, a threaded thing that screws into the quarter 20 threads and you just do counterclockwise and take it off i don't know what age those those are but uh about half of my binoculars have that and can go onto uh, a tripod with no trouble and the other half have some strange thread that doesn't work you just have to unscrew that little cap there in the middle uh, that little cap yeah, right there. It That's might come off. That off and yeah, it, just try to it, try to go counterclockwise. It should just unscrew. I popped this off a little while ago while doing the presentation. It doesn't look like there's any screw in there. It's like uh, 
Yeah. It's just it's just a blank. There's no threads on that. I can't no, there's tell. There's no threads. Okay. Yeah, I had, I had that problem. So I finally did what you just suggested. I got one of those flat plates and uh, strapped the binoculars on. That'll work too. I have one of those, Rob. <clears throat> if you need a picture of one, I can send it. Oh, the, the tripod that has a plate that you can strap your binoculars on? Well, isn't it, the, isn't the it more is like separate. a sandwich? You can just like... It basically it, it 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 mounts the L bracket, and then you can just like sandwich your binoculars between the plate, right? I Something would like have that. to send you a picture of what I have, but the way it works is is a flat plate, and there's like a Velcro strap. Yeah. And the bottom of the plate has a quarter twenty thread, so that you could screw it into a tripod head does that make sense yeah i've seen that googling around okay well i'll tell you another super cheapo trick i learned this from um stephen talking in the uk he he had a mop with a telescoping handle so he rested his binoculars on the padded end of the mop and he bungee corded them onto the mop. So super low tech, but it works. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not quite as steady as a tripod. No, it's not. But if you can deal with a monopod arrangement, it was, i would never thought of that. It's However, actually, you can, you can get them in Lowe's. They're, they're also the things you use to sand sheetrock. They're yeah. just flat and you, they have a clip on either end to hold the whole sandpaper, and you just put your your strap into those clips and then strap it on. I, I use that too, but it's not quite as good as a real mount. Oh, absolutely not. Um, so, Rob, you've looked online for this kind of arrangement for your Nikon's. Uh, yeah, and uh, and I was hoping to find something that had a couple of small mini knobs that allows me to find. You know, adjust the altitude azimuth um, once I, I got it sort of, could it, yeah, um, and, and just be able to pan slowly across a region um, yeah. without being too expensive. But I haven't really found anything. The parallelogram mount that I have is great for the job you just described. Yeah, that's, that's the best way to go if you can get one. Yeah. But, you know, for a for a eight by fifty, you, did you say eight by fifty? Uh, these are ten by fifty. Oh, at ten power, you might want a parallelogram now. Yeah, you might. You, you can if also. You're handy. I know people make their own. I'm not well, very. Actually, handy, yeah, you can find plans on the internet. Yeah, that's what just make about your own out of wood. Okay, I'll look around. Yeah, we actually Steve, Steve Goodman has a huge set of those. Yeah. Any other questions? Let me make a comment about Phyllis's uh, 76 year old binoculars. I'm guessing at that age, they don't have the magical B, B A, let's see, B K, but no, it's B A. B A K. BK4, right? Yeah, <laughs> but like the uh, Zeiss optics were so good that you would be very pleased with them anyway. And if your Nikons are really old, they may not either. You can tell if you hold them away from your eye about a foot and look at a, a flat wall or some even surface, if you're seeing perfectly round uh, exit pupils, then they're the BK, BAK4. And if they're sort of uh, have a little edge to them, they're the BK7. But it's probably irrelevant, uh, you know, Most to this yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, you can actually turn your binoculars around, look through the objectives, and kind of focus through the through the ocular, and you can actually see the bubbles in the glass with, uh, <laughs> with BK7s, BAK7s. Bummer. Don't go looking for trouble. <laughs> Anything else? Guess not. 
Uh, so I guess I am working on a couple more classes to come. One will be on using charts. So we'll talk about that maybe next time. Uh, I don't know whether that'll be in a month's time or maybe a little more. I've got several things going on between now and early October. So we'll see. Please stay tuned. It was a great presentation, Phyllis. Thank you so much for doing it. Yeah, thank so you. Welcome. Thank you.